Thank you, songsters. And Debbie, I never think that's a mistake. <laughs> I needed to hear that twice. And I love this theme that we've been in, all that I am, my time, my talents, and my treasures. I love this theme, and it's spoken to me in a different way each and every week that we've been in it so far. And as I was preparing for this sermon, my time here today, I thought, well, this was pretty crafty of my husband because he planned the series. And so far, his sermons have gone right along the breakdown of that theme. He started with an overview, all that I am. Then he talked about our time. Last week, he talked about our talents. We have Stewardship Sunday coming up, and he's going to talk about our treasures after that. So I thought, well, how convenient that I'm the one stuck in there without a title, <laughs> with nothing to speak on, right? Well, what should I do? Should I remind you of what we've already talked about? Should I give you a preview of what's to come? Well, instead, I originally set out to talk about our good act of service. And I landed in Luke 10, which is where our scripture begins, but not at the scripture that's chosen for today. I landed with the Good Samaritan. And as I was studying that scripture, my eyes kept wandering down. And you'll notice that our first scripture comes right after the Good Samaritan because God was leading me somewhere else, and I could hear him telling me, not the Good Samaritan, talk to them about Mary. And I thought, no, Lord, because me and Mary don't get along. <laughs> I knew that God wanted me to talk about Mary, but that whole Mary and Martha debate, you know the one, the one that's always surrounded by this story, well, I usually tend to side with Martha. I get Martha. I understand where Martha's coming from. Martha and I, we could be friends. Mary, on the other hand, we have our issues. <laughs> and so I thought, well, usually what God has for the congregation, he has for me first. And so this is where we are in Luke chapter 10, where our scripture begins. Jesus was coming over. It doesn't go into a lot of detail about the preparations of Martha and let's be fair, Mary, before his arrival. But knowing what we know about Martha, there were details. <laughs> Maybe she folded the guest towels a certain way. Maybe she had those cute little cards that go at everybody's place that tells the babe of who sat where. I love those things. We don't know what the details were, but knowing what we know about Martha, there were details, and she was distracted by them. We find in verse 40, maybe someone at this point had tracked mud onto the pristine floors, or maybe something needed to be stirred, candles needed to be lit, Something needed to happen. We don't know the details, but what we do know is that Mary wasn't there. She wasn't helping. Where was she? She was with Jesus. Once she arrived, she or once he arrived, she took off. And things started to head south for poor Martha. See, the thing about it is, and here's the point, there is nothing wrong with preparation. As we learned last week, God created us each individually with unique talents and abilities, aren't you thankful that there are Marthas in this world? Those that make plans, those that can bring some order out of chaos, those that provide steps towards a goal. We are thankful for Marthas that make lists, that check the lists, that check them again. Didn't I tell you Martha and I would get along? <laughs> but here's where she goes wrong, and it's in verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. It's never a good thing when God says your name twice. <laughs> the Lord answered, you are worried and upset over many things, but only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus was gentle with Martha, but he told her, Mary has chosen the better part. And that's the part that's always confused me. What is the better part? So I went and I looked it up, and I found a lot of different commentaries and a lot of different opinions, but one that kept coming back to me, and the one that really sat well in my heart, is the interpretation of the better part as seeking the kingdom first. That would make sense for Mary neglecting her kitchen duties that day because the kingdom was now sitting in her living room. 
She put her priorities first. The Word of God has first claim, first attention, first focus. The preceding parable, the one where I started with the Good Samaritan, shows the importance of loving service to our neighbor, but even that has to take second place to having a relationship with the Savior. As is revealed in the story of Martha and Mary, Martha was performing worthwhile tasks, but she was consumed by the task. Jesus does not criticize her for what she is doing, but by her preoccupation with it, over and above sitting with him and hearing his word. Mary emerges here as an example of someone willing to sit at Jesus' feet in fellowship with him as a disciple. Oh, and I love that Mary was a disciple, but I won't get started in that. But often in the busyness of life and the things that are happening and the things that cloud our mind and attention, we need to pause for a moment or two or 12 and have a quiet time with the Lord, a time of reflection with him before we move on with task. Jesus' reply to Martha, even speaking her name twice, indicates that Mary is doing the better thing and that Martha should have been there with her. Discipleship sometimes requires that tasks be put aside while fellowship is maintained. Please understand that as a captain of the Salvation Army doing the most good, I am not saying that the task and the things that we do are not valuable or needed. Absolutely the opposite is true. I am saying if they are done without a heart that is first and foremost with the Savior and focused on Christ, then they are not the better part. Jesus wants a relationship that is so deep and so full that it spills out in helpful service to him and for our neighbors. Relationship with Jesus does take our time and it cannot be replaced in our priorities. It is our first and most important priority. And Mary shows the importance of reflecting on what Jesus teaches. Now today, we don't have him sitting in our living room, but it does translate into everyday time with the Lord, time in reading his word, time in letting him speak to us as we listen in prayer and in listening to his voice. It is a great temptation to serve at the expense of being fed spiritually. And that's where Martha went wrong, unfortunately. <laughs> Some activities can wait. Our relationship with our Savior must come first. Our second scripture, if you want to turn there, if you'll jump to John chapter 11, verses 17 through 32, we pick up again with Jesus' friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But this time, Lazarus is dead, and Jesus enters the scene. And guess who's the first to meet him at the gate? Martha. Good old Martha. She heard he was coming, and she ran out to meet him. She's so practical. And she probably couldn't stay in that house that was grieving any longer. Do you know, when there's a time of mourning, there's always somebody that says, well, let me put the coffee on. Or let, let me get us something to eat. I know, because it's, sometimes it's me. And that's the spirit of Martha. Martha sounds like a southern gal to me a little bit. She expresses this great faith in Jesus, though, when she meets him. It is simply a fact, she declares, that if he had been with them, her brother would not have died. And even now, she is certain that whatever Jesus asks for, God will give him. Now, I'm not going to go into the, and I didn't even have Megan read that part, the resurrection of Lazarus today, because that's an entirely different sermon and one that I've actually given here, so we won't do that today. But I wanted to point out that the relationship with Martha and her Savior has progressed. She indicates that she has faith in Jesus, but she does not yet grasp the power of life in him. And so Jesus asks Martha directly, this question, if she believes. In verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Then he asks her, do you believe this? And while it appears she doesn't understand the whole of what Jesus is talking about here, she accepts him. She confesses him 
that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he came from God himself into the world. This means that Jesus stands with her on one of the worst days of her life. Lazarus is not yet risen. He stands with her on a day of despair and pain and terror and offers her life. And Martha accepts. Go, Martha. But then Jesus wants to see Mary. Of course he wants to see Mary. She's perfect. She was in the house. She was overcome with grief and the loss of her brother. But when Martha told Mary, Jesus wants to see you, what does she do? She runs to meet him quickly, so quickly that people start to follow her. They think, well, something's going on (laughs) because Mary got up quickly. And all she could do, not a word is spoken, she falls at his feet in adoring worship. And then she says, even though like Martha, she believes that Jesus has come too late, she is overcome with gratitude because Jesus has come. How tenderly Jesus meets those sisters, as different as they are, and as different as we are. He meets us where we are. We must make the effort to meet with him and promote that relationship, that commitment to him. Now, Zach and I have been officers for 11 years, I think, 11 or 12. And in in that time, we've had the opportunity of um, having a pre-training kind of um, mentorship with something like 27 candidates. It's been fabulous. It's been amazing. And we hope it continues. (laughs) Got it? (laughs) But we, um, we had one since the very beginning. And I don't know if everybody knows this, but Jeff Marquis, if you were here over the past couple of years, you'll know that he went into training from Clearwater. But this isn't where he started with us. He started back in our first core appointment in one of our first weeks there in Danville, Kentucky. He was there. He was a freshman at Asbury College, and he was one of our students. So in our five years in Danville, corresponded with his four years at Asbury. And then he went to Texas, and we went to Texas. Then he came to Florida, and we came to Florida. I'd say that he was following us around, but it's kind of been the opposite. But he was there in Danville when we first got there. And when we got there, Emma was three months old, and Jeff was her absolute favorite. Now, if you know Jeff, you'll know that he has sort of an intimidating presence about him, okay? Something that I thought a three-month-old would be scared to death of. (laughs) Here they are. But, Je- but Emma absolutely loved Jeff. She was his absolute favorite. And aside, he fed her her first solid food. She was three months old. I handed, him, uh, I handed Emma off to Jeff for just a moment as I went and um, did something at the core. I came back, and she was eating cake, icing down her chin, down her front. And he says, you know, Miss Bell, she doesn't eat this very well. Well, that's because she's three months old and has never had solid food. <laughs> but he let her eat cake. Maybe that's why she loved him so much. But Jeff and Emma, they had this special relationship and even a special language between the two of them. Jeff knew what Emma wanted, if she wanted to rest in his arms or if she wanted to play or, like you see here, if she wanted to be on his shoulders. Now, she was a little older here, but you can see um, this was a, an occurrence that happened all the time. Emma loved being on Jeff's shoulders because she was the tallest in the building then. She loved it. They had a special, special bond. Until one summer, when Jeff left on summer break, as students do, he came back and he expected to pick right up where he had left off, where he had done the other summers when Emma was younger, but something was different this pe- that time. He came back and she didn't know him. She didn't know him quite as well. She remembered him, she looked at him, but it wasn't the same. Their relationship wasn't the same. He hadn't spent that time with her daily. He was always at our house, always at the core, and Emma was always with him up until then. But when he got back, it just wasn't the same, and it never was. It was kind of devastating to Jeff. But then it made me think of our relationship. How was our relationship with Jesus? How was our daily uninterrupted time with the one that is the most important? Do we take the day, the week, or the summer off? Or is our relationship so close that we seem to have our own language? Mary had that relationship. 
And she sat at the feet of Jesus in her home in an obedient wonder, taking in the word of God. This has to take precedence over any act of service or worship we can do to the glory of God. And then we see Mary again, during that time that was probably the toughest time of her life. Again, at the feet of Jesus, this time in her despair, yes, at the same time in her unwavering love and trust of her Messiah. Our last encounter with Mary of Bethany is found just a chapter over in chapter 12, and it's what we saw portrayed on the short video earlier. It's a dinner party in Bethany. Lazarus entertains. Martha, what is she doing? Of course, she's serving. Mary, we find, once again, at the feet of Jesus. This time, she is giving the gift that she would always be known for. Now, you got to know, there is so much happening at this dinner party. First of all, Jesus was a wanted man at the time. The Sanhedrin had given an order that if anyone knew where Jesus was, they should report it to the authorities. And yet, they're having a dinner party, openly. So they were all accessories to the crime at this point. Not to mention that the party host had been dead a couple of days ago, okay? So if Lazarus isn't a good dinner party topic, then I don't know what is. But that's not what you and I remember of this dinner party. What all of us would be remembering thousands of years later, what the disciples wrote long afterwards is not any of that, but it's about Mary's gift at that dinner party. She pours out that costly perfume, which we know is worth about a year's wages, and even wipes it with her hair on his feet. This gift is extravagant. But even more than that extravagant gift was the gift of her knowing her Savior. You see, unlike anyone else in that room, although they had been told over and over and over again, Mary was the only one that knew Jesus was about to die. He had told his disciples, but they just weren't getting it. But Mary, she understood. It's like they had a secret language. Mary and Jesus. And now she broke that box of perfume over Jesus to prepare him for his burial because she understood. How did Mary understand these things that were... um, that were unknown that particularly the disciples didn't even get. The answer is in where she was all along and where we find her now. And that's where, at the feet of Jesus, right? We've been talking a lot about giving our time and our talent and our treasure. And last week we were given the challenge that our stewardship flows out of our relationship. Today I hope that we've examined that where that relationship begins and takes root and ends is at the feet of Christ. Jesus tells us through each example of Mary that what we do is far less important than who he wants us to be. We have so much to learn and so much for him to teach us at his feet. We're gonna look at Psalm 600, and thank you, Isaac, for playing that first thing this morning. Jesus, thou art everything to me, because that is what this stewardship thing is all about. It's already his. He wants to fill us with himself. And our stewardship flows out of that rich relationship that we daily have with him. Our stewardship, all that we could ever give, begins and grows and ends at the feet of Christ. Are you distracted by worry? by the task at hand, the busyness that we can get ourselves into, just like Martha was. Jesus calls us to the better part, and that is to be sitting at his feet, focused on him, and that is where our service flows from. Are you in the middle of turmoil and despair? I know many of you are grieving, just like the sisters on those days after Lazarus had died. At the feet of Jesus is again where we find Mary, not knowing what would happen, but knowing that she trusted her Savior. Do we desire to give ourselves extravagantly and to understand the things of Christ 
It begins at his feet when we tell him, Jesus, thou art everything to me. All my lasting joys are found in thee. That's telling him, Jesus, you are first in my life. And that, when we give it back to him, is the most extravagant gift. Use this time to reconnect. We'll pray together. Deepen that relationship that you have with the Savior. Make it real and make it true. Jesus, tender lover of my soul, partner of my sins and friend indeed. Let's sing together on that first verse. Jesus, tender lover today. The third verse, here I lay me at thy bleeding feet. Once again, we be like Mary at his feet. Let's sing together on that third verse. Mm-hmm. 